Hello, everyone. Shh, shh. <laughs> Works like, you know. <laughs> it, was, it doesn't work with my kids. I don't know why it's working. <laughs> um, hello, everyone, as I said. Um, I'm very pleased to close this day uh, talking about data science, and especially why Scala is most probably the favorite language that we have to, to use in this uh, new area, at least for the language. I'm very pleased to, to do it with uh, President Snow from Lineband, and myself from the, from the zoo of uh, Belgium, if you know it, uh, Anvers. Very great zoo, you should go there. So I'm giving Vink show uh, every day there. Anyway, um, so of course, Dean Wampler. Who doesn't know Dean Wampler? Yeah, who doesn't know me? Ah, man. <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't know me? <laughs> OK, so um, I'm Andy Petrella from the company De La Felas in Belgium. So we mainly do De La Science. Um, we do a lot of Spark, but we do data science on data science. I won't expand on that right now, but this is mainly what we do. Right, so Lightband, of course you guys know what Lightband's all about. And we started working with uh, Spark about a year ago because it's written in Scala and uh, kind of expanding what, what we think is possible with, um, there's really two kinds of people you run into in, in this big data world. There's the data engineers who are doing the plumbing they're closest to what we typically do, and then there's the data scientists. So the data engineers have largely picked Scala as the tool of choice, um, and both Kafka and uh, Spark are written in it as, along with other tools, and now we're starting to see data scientists take an interest in it as well. So Scala, why Scala? <clears throat> Three reasons. I will cover them in two minutes, and then it's okay, so we can pull it and go back home. Um, no, actually, the, the talk will be in uh, several folds. The first uh, fold will be a few reasons about why Scala, and then we will have examples uh, running straight in a notebook. So um, let's start with the reasons. So there are three reasons. So why uh, I've been asked recently at Strata why the data science need a new language, and I said, yeah, actually, it doesn't need a new language. First, it needs a new platform. It needs a new runtime. So far, R, MATLAB, Python, and so on were used, but actually, most of the time, these environments are not enterprise ready. However, the JVM is 20 plus years now approved and improved by 10 plus million people around. So that means that a lot of people have focused their intention on enterprise ready platform for services, for tooling, for software, whatsoever. That means that JVM is most probably one of the best choices around to now taking over the data science wave. Next, functional. Of course, I mean, now we are dealing a lot with uh, big data or fast data or a lot of models, assembling models, deep learning, and so on. That means that we cannot really handle that onto a single machine. If we cannot do that onto a single machine, maybe we can take it over and then distribute the data. And rather than taking the data back to the computer, right, it's better to send the data uh, send the function, sorry, to the data. So we have to write functions and serialize them and send them over. So it's better to do that into a functional language. So we know that in Java, for instance, it's very painful to do it. So rather than maybe taking Java on the JVM, it's better to take Scala. Because it's simple. It's simple. So we might think, okay, so there is also closure. But actually, the thing is that closure is very far from what the people know already. Uh, if you think about Matei, right, so he wanted to test Mesos, he created Spark, he did uh, it in, in, uh, in Scala because of JVM, and also because Scala is very simple. You can read it uh, while you're just a Java or Python developer. It's very close to them. So this, these are the three reasons I would use when I've been asked, okay, why Scala? Now, uh, Dean, William Wapro will explain a little bit more detail why Scala, why the feature of Scala are very important for data scientists. Yeah, the way I'm going to do this is actually with the tool that uh, uh, Andy wrote called the uh, Spark Notebook. Is it uh, this one? It's this one. Okay. So Spark Notebook, so if you come from the data science world, you're actually used to working in notebooks. And this is sort of the electronic analog of the lab notebooks that you may have used when you took chemistry in like college or whatever, where you, you intersperse you know, experimental results and graphs and you know, comments and documentation 
and it's a very nice way to work. I actually think that developers would, should actually use these too, especially in situations where you would use the Scala REPL to, to do like interactive exploring. And you'll see why it's a really nice way to actually work when you're just basically working with the REPL, which is what it's effectively doing. So uh, you, know, you can organize these in directories. We have three of them here. Uh, this one uh, is the one that I wrote. I actually included a PDF, so if you go to that link that you just saw and uh, you come up to the um, uh, Git repo with these notebooks, you can actually just look at the PDF for this stuff without actually running uh, Spark Notebook. There we go. <clears throat> I think I launched it twice. Let me kill one of these. No, there we go, that's it. All right, so what you can see here, these are cells. And each of these cells are actually just Markdown. So you can intersperse comments in Markdown. You can actually you know, hook in things like LaTeX if you want to do mathematics and that kind of stuff. And there's Shift. And so th then I can evaluate these. If I do Shift Enter, it'll just evaluate each of these cells. Here it's just parsing the uh, Markdown, so there's not too much that's exciting. But we'll see in a second, we'll actually get to some, some real code. So, uh, we've done this talk several times now to, as you can see, this bullet list here, which could be a little bigger. Let's actually make that a little bigger. Uh, there it is. Okay. Um, so when we do this for a data audience, I tend to describe the Scala features, but presumably all of you know the Scala features already, so I'm just going to highlight why they're more useful uh, in the data context. The way this notebook is organized, I actually turned it in kind of a, into a very long list of why Scala is better than Java. Uh, but a lot of that stuff isn't so important for data science and for Spark in particular. For example, you really don't write recursive functions very often in Spark because typically you have this big system that's you know, running through your data in parallel and you don't actually do recursion much. But that's a really, you know, the tail recursion optimization is a great feature for us in general, but it's not so useful for Spark. So that's the second half of these, uh, this uh, notebook here, and we won't go through that. We'll just focus on why uh, Scala is really nice for data science. All right, so if I scroll down a little bit. The first one I'll, that's pretty obvious when you think about it is um, functional programming, and that includes things like you know, the immutability of, of, of results, no side effects, and things like that. And it turns out, as you'll see in a second, if you don't already know this, it's the most concise way to work with data. For me, um, big data or fast data, whatever term you want to use, is really the killer app for functional programming, more so than concurrency. And I, and I think that turned out to be true because more people are having to learn how to work with data uh, than they're having to learn how to write concurrent code. You know, we, we always seem to find a way to uh, avoid that problem with toolkits like Akka or whatever. But this is really forcing people to recognize that you know, sort of old object-oriented thinking isn't optimal for uh, the modern world. So anyway, uh, going a little farther here. So that's the first one. And I have some sections that I, I'll just briefly comment in today, but I describe uh, the other three languages that are used with Spark. Python, R, and Java, and you know, how well they support these particular topics. And really among these, Java's getting better as we know. Uh, Python is sort of a mixed bag, but nothing really feels as functional of these four as Scala does. And it becomes one of these things where you really want to get into this mode of thinking about transformations of data, and you don't want to have to like context switch and think, how do I map this to objects? How do I map this to some weirdness about the Python API, et cetera? It lets you think in the, in the idioms that you want to think in and then just write them down, which is really valuable. Uh, and there's a few uh, sub-bullets here of things that people have mentioned to me when I've given this talk before, how like traits and interfaces make it easy to compose code and have reasonable behavior and mix in composition, which benefits big data projects as well as normal projects. And also, if you're using the Java Stream API, it's a more functional API now, but you find yourself flipping back and forth between that and the old style Java collections. And that's also one of those things of unnecessary detail that you have to keep in, in your mind as you're working with stuff. But really, when, at the end of the day, Matei Zaharia, when he created Spark, said, I'm going to use Scala because I really love the, the Scala collections. They have the right you know, metaphors for what I'm trying to do. So let's see what that looks like. I'm going to start with a, a naive algorithm for computing primes. This is our first actual code. 
And uh, you know, when I, so now I'm, I've selected it, I haven't evaluated it, and as soon as I evaluate it, now I've got this thing that was parsed by the REPL and I have this function I can use. Um, and here's a, a kind of a silly example, but one that will look almost identical in Spark, where I'm just gonna take the numbers from one to 100, uh, map over them to create a tuple you know, with you know, the number and whether or not it's prime, then group by whether it's prime, so I'll end up with two records you know, for the trues and the falses, and then I'll print out a final tuple of you know, true, false, and the size. And it turns out, this is something I did not know until I did this, that exactly one-third are, are not prime, and one-third are prime, when you go exactly from one to 100 inclusive, which is kind of an interesting result. <clears throat> And here's what the thing looks like in Spark, and it's nearly identical. The three lines in the middle that are indented, I just copied and pasted. The only thing that's different are I have to set it up in a different way. You start with this thing called a Spark context that knows how to connect to your cluster and all that. You take the range and you turn it into Spark's own data structure called a resilient distributed data set with this parallelized method. Then you do the same operations that you already know, that you've already you know, learned by being a Scala programmer. The one thing that's different at the end, though, is that these are lazy operations. We're actually building up an abstract syntax tree that's only evaluated when we ask for results. Collect actually takes the RDD, turns it into a regular Scala collection, and brings it back into my local driver program, which is this notebook. So <clears throat> when I run this, I'll get the same result, hopefully. And there it is, and you can see it did a little bit fancier stuff. And Spark Notebook has these nice features of uh, when you return an RDD, it will display in a table format, and you can do things like, you know, look at histograms, which are kind of boring at this, in this case, but uh, interesting nonetheless. All right. All right, so I mentioned what RDDs are. I won't belabor that point. Uh, they are the fancy thing that look like, you know, vectors or something, but in fact are distributed over a, a cluster and have some resilience properties, which is what the R is for. And, uh, you know, the API for Python is nearly the same. I kind of joke that if you used a color scheme where curly braces were white on white, uh, it would look like Python code when you write Spark code. It's, it's nearly that, it's almost that, that close. But um, none of the other APIs for R and Java are nearly as concise and elegant. And that becomes so important when you're trying to build non-trivial algorithms in this stuff. Here's an advantage we all know and love, which is the fact that we can do this interpreted experience. We can experiment with our data. We can run interactive queries. We can uh, go back to previous code in the notebook and edit it easily and rerun it. That's one thing that I really love about notebooks versus the raw REPL. But it's the same kind of experience that we, of course, have known for a long time in Python and R. And we are now going to get this in Java. You can actually download the latest uh, you know, JDK build for Java 9, and there's actually an interpreter in it kind of, it only took 20 years, that, you know, kind of amazing. Here's something that is, you know, it's sort of this mundane thing we take for granted, but my gosh, it makes so much uh, sense when you're writing data stuff. It's often true that you just want to use a tuple to represent your records. And it's, it's so easy to do this in, uh, um, with Scala. So this is basically what we've been doing. I've been just using parentheses to build, you know, two element tuples and just forget about it. I just do it and it's done. So it's, it's just an incredible advantage. Whereas, if you use Java, you know, you don't get this at all in the library, and Spark actually added its own sort of, they call it a mutable pair type, which is what this is. You have to do this explicitly if you want to work with tuples, and it's, it's kind of stupid um, not to have that convenience that we just saw. The other thing that's incredibly important is pattern matching. There's so many times when you have some structure, some record, and you want to rip it apart and restructure it or throw things away. Uh, this is basically the same program we've been running where I just rewrote it using pattern matching. You know, kind of a trivial example, uh, again, but nonetheless, it's so nice that I can now use meaningful names for these fields. Uh, and once you know the pattern matching stuff, as we all know, it's just really concise to think about what you want to do with that record, rip it apart, put it back together, and you're done. And lo and behold, we got the same result, which is kind of amazing. <coughs> and so I'd explain what all these pattern matching stuff means, but this is uh, familiar stuff. And I just love this too, that if you know the exact structure of your uh, object, you can just rip the whole thing apart, no matter how deeply nested it is. And you're not limited, of course, to built-in types because of case classes, our old friends here, you know, we can do 
uh, records as case objects, or case uh, instances rather. Uh, we get all this other stuff for free that we love, and then we can do pattern matching on that. So it's pretty common in Spark, like if I'm reading raw text files, like say log files, I'll just parse them into a case class that represents the record, and then I can do pattern matching to, to tease things apart like we're doing here. So I made up this record with um, Andy and I, and we both happen to be very young people still, as you can tell. And, uh, you know, we get these, you know, our ages and whatnot. So all just by pattern matching, ripping things apart, and we're done. What do you mean 40? What is this? <laughs> you just turned, yeah. You, you, just edited, yeah. you just edited. I just copied you with yeah. uh, one year more. Anyway, all right, I'll let it go this time. Um, and once again, this is stuff you do not get in these other languages, so it really makes it very concise to work with this code. And uh, for me, it's just, a, it, it was, I, when I started doing Hadoop consulting, it was a horrible experience because the tooling was so bad. And it became fun when I started using tools like Scalding, and, which is a precursor to Spark. Spark. Type inference is an interesting thing in this case, uh, it, really for the same reasons that we know and love it already, that it, it, it removes the ceremony of inserting all these type annotations, yet we get type safety and we get feedback, especially in using the REPL about what we've just comp constructed. So I'm sitting here trying to learn Spark, and I don't know quite what I got when I did this operation here, but lo and behold, it tells me I created an RDD of these two element tuples. And I just get that information right away. Well, I found that when I was learning the Python API for Spark, I would inevitably like print out the first five elements of everything just to figure out what I had just constructed because there was no feedback. So this you know, is something that we've all probably experienced, but you really notice this when working with um, uh, Spark as well. Plus, we get the extra type safety. And of course, Java gives us type safety too, but then we have all the extra ceremony of adding types and so forth. It also is really convenient to have the unification of primitives and types. This is, you know, as in contrast to Java, where I can just say things like list of string, list of integer, or, you know, int, float, double string, and my tuples, and I don't have to, like, do these, you know, boxing conversions or manually or, or whatever. It's just automatically uh, treated in a consistent way. Uh, the second to last point is the fact that we can do domain-specific language is really nice in Spark. This is a slightly more involved example, so let me just walk through it. Um, so we don't have to do the import for SQL. That what used to be in here, construct uh, the SQL yeah, it's context. Just to, to point to the right folder, but if you... Oh, you're using the... Okay, yeah, you're using... Got it, got it, got it. Um, yeah, we, we've been editing this sort of in parallel lately. Uh, so I'm going to use an environment variable that actually tells the notebook where I put my data set. So let's evaluate that quickly, you know, just regular Scala. Um, I'm going to write a, a, the equivalent of a SQL query, and this is amazing API that they've added on top of that RDD API where I can use this new uh, reference object called a Spark session. I can get a reader, and then I can just read JSON. It'll parse it. It'll figure out the schema of the records. In this case, this is data for all the airports in North America. Uh, and, you know, it just parses it and I'm done. I don't have to think about it anymore. You can see it's showing the schema uh, here. Uh, and, you know, it obviously leads the, uh, the results a little bit to fit in the screen. So that's kind of a cool thing. Uh, caching is a way of saying, I'm going to go over this data repeatedly, so I want you to hold it in memory and not just force me to go back to disk every time. And then I put in the second airport's DF, which is the object, so it would print out uh, a nice formatted table of the airports. <coughs> and there, I forget how many there are, something like a thousand or something. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's paged. It's pretty big, but, and so this is by default, I think, 20. And then here's the point. So we built up to this, and now we can write the equivalent of a SQL query. And this API, the reason that this is the DSL section, right? This API is an idiomatic Scala version of an idiomatic Python API called Data Frames which was itself copied from the R language uh, API called data frames. So the, this is effectively a SQL query. I'm going to group by my state and country where these airports are located. I'm going to count the size of each groups, and then I'm going to print them out by count descending. So you can just picture in your head what the SQL query would look like. And if I had time, I would go ahead and write it out too. Um, it sh I had it print the schema, so the schema is going to be three elements. And then uh, it's going to print the, the first hundred of them. And it turns out um, Alaska has the most airports of any U.S. state. 
And they're mostly little uh, like bush airports for people that are flying into the mountains and stuff like that. So we can write the equivalent of SQL queries. There's some amazing optimizations behind the scenes, but we could also either do this with a regular SQL query in a string, which is stringly typed, or we can use this idiomatic DSL up here um, to construct DSLs that you know, represent some concept we want. So this last section, nine, is the one that talks about things that really are benefits for Scala in general, but less important for data science. Um, and I'll let you read that on your own. I'll just finish with a, a I'll go the right direction here. Just a few final points about disadvantages of Scala, just in the interest of full disclosure. If I can get to it here. I have a lot of points in here now, as you can see. So, by the way, please send pull requests. If you have any other things you think are better or worse about Scala versus Java, let me know. But the disadvantages, there's really three I list here. Uh, there's still a lot more tools for data science in Python and R. That's the limitation we need to fix. And the JVM itself has some issues, and I'm going to get into this in detail in my talk tomorrow. Like the fact that arrays are indexed by integers, which means we can only have two billion elements. And if it's a byte array, you only get two gigabytes of data when, you know, now you can get like a two terabyte RAM instance on Amazon. So uh, it's really bad that we are actually indexing by integers. And then it turns out, as beautiful as the JVM is at representing arbitrary objects and graphs like you know, some person type I've got here, it really sucks for garbage collection and performance and cache awareness and all that stuff when I've got billions of these things. So Spark actually introduced uh, a new encoding for objects that are records. And I'll get into this a lot tomorrow if you're interested. And it turns out we've actually found some weird behaviors in the REPL when you start loading gigabytes of data in the REPL. And I'll also talk about that. But so those are teasers for tomorrow. All right. Great. So this was uh, regarding this kind of features, of course. But as you said, so we are still lacking of, you know, many tooling. In Scala, so uh, tooling and models. Maybe we are lacking of models. However, now it's maybe the good time to port existing models to Scala or the JVM. But also, it's a good time to invent new models because now we have the the power, we have the use cases coming, and uh, yeah, there is certainly a lot of different ways to solve the same problem in data science. So it's the right time to come up with new solutions. Um, so. Regarding the tooling, I would say that um, this is what I started with the Spark Notebook, to be honest. So I'm using Spark for three years now or something, since 0.5 or 0.4, something like that. And very quickly, I was fed up by using my REPL because I couldn't reuse my work um, easily, and I had to always to go back in the history and so on. Uh, it was really painful, and also I didn't have any visualization and so on. So, and I didn't want it to go back in my history doing Python and R again. Uh, so I started this project, the Spy Notebook, which was initially based on the Scanner Notebook. Uh, that I ported to too many, uh, so many things uh, into it. And regarding these examples, they are actually in this repository. So you can fork it, you can clone it. And this repository is Docker enabled. So there is a Docker file, and there is a Docker which is already published with Spark 2.00 preview. So you can use that one and also uh, benefit from the, in, the local installation to use directly uh, preview the Spark 2.00, which should be cut. No, the RC should be cut soon, um, by the way. But it's still an RC. Well, um, so the next notebook that I'm going to cover. Um, is called why Spark Notebook then? So why do you want to use a Spark Notebook instead of many others? Um, so I'm going to make a little bit more room there. Um, so the idea of the Spark Notebook is to fill the gap uh, in data science. Uh, that means that we bring a lot of things uh, coming from what I used to use, like RStudio or, or IPython at that time, uh, but directly on the GJVM. So, uh, it's a pretty successful project so far. I had more, I, I'm reaching now uh, 1,350 uh, stars. A lot of people is involved in the Gitter channel, so we have almost 500 per person there now. A lot of messages, so a lot of activity there to help people, not only on Spark Notebook, but also Spark related to work in, in the, 
uh, how to work in the in the in the spy notebook. So I will do a little bit of uh, uh, formatting so I can uh, uh, track my my. Uh, my flow. So the thing is, so why it's one of the biggest feature feature of the of the Spark notebook is that it has the capacity to start multiple Spark contexts. That means that you won't suffer from clashes in the class path. Why? Because each time you start a new a notebook, so you when you click essentially on the on the on the notebook and you open this page, it starts a dedicated JVM behind the scene. So this JVM which is dedicated to this specific notebook is actually containing a spy driver, which can define whatever classes, whatever packages that you want to include into it. And that can define how it will deal with, uh, with the cluster, so uh, asking for a few more memory than the others, for instance, and so whatsoever. So you can tune it the way you like it. And, and you won't clash with other people. So you won't blow the, the driver because you have used more uh, memory than the others. So this is one of the biggest features, make, which makes it way more stable than uh, original uh, or older uh, notebooks, let's say. And of course, by default, when you start it, it's going to create for you a few items, uh, objects like the Spark session, and also, of course, uh, the legacy now, the Spark's context, and uh, its alias uh, SC. So you have them, so you can start work, working right ahead with, uh, with Spark. So now a few things. That means that I'm, I like to have reproducibility uh, into my process. So I like to have my notebook to be uh, fully reproducible into other environment. That means that I'm defining a lot of things within the metadata, not the notebook itself, right? In the metadata of the notebook. So I don't want, it, I don't want them to pollute my, uh, my environment. So that means that here in the, in the metadata of the Spark notebook, I have defined this Spark configuration, which redefined the default parallelism. And if I Normally it should be eight because I have eight cores, but here it's four because I've parsed it and I've uh, reconfigured the Spark configuration on the fly based on this metadata. Um, also, you can define uh, your dependencies using an SBT-like syntax. So here, for instance, I've included the Kafka uh, library, and you, it's very small, but you don't see it, but actually I will show it after, but there is a specific syntax that allows us to use underscore in this uh, metadata in order to catch all. I will get back to that after. So these dependencies are downloaded by the Spark Notebook and injected into the class path, so you don't have to do anything. And also, they are put into your spark.jars uh, configuration variable, so they will be also shipped to the cluster for you, so you don't have to do anything about it. Um, that means that you can then use, you know, for instance, the Spark connector uh, for Cassandra, or the Kafka libraries are available out there, so I didn't have to define anything but in the metadata. So uh, this can be configured using this panel, and you see here I have used underscore there, which is a uh, word card for please use the current Spark version. Like double, you know, uh, double a person in SBT means please use the current SBT uh, Scala version. Underscore means uh, please the, uh, the current <coughs> Scala, uh, Spark version, sorry. And then you have the custom uh, configuration. Um, actually, something else which is very helpful, so I was really quickly fed up as well going constantly to the cluster, right, to see my logs, right? So in Mesos, you have to go to different machines, see the logs or whatever. Here, actually, when you do something, uh, might it be in Spark or whatsoever, everything is logged in the browser. So you don't have to go to Yarn or to Mesos anymore. You can just open your browser and console and everything it will be out there. And if you have errors, you will be always, um, you, will, you will have the capacity to reprint the errors uh, using a panel that I will show you right after. And the side pane, which is not shown right now, uh, is actually uh, there. Actually not shown because. So the side pane, which doesn't want to show, by the way, there we are. Um, I will load it because actually I did something wrong. There we are. Yeah. yeah. There, and then the sidebar contains a few things. So when I will create variables, like here, it will um, retain all the information all there. So if I'm here, 
and I want to know where REST19 uh, was defined. I click on it, and then it brings me back to the cell. I'm, I was a very a fan of RStudio, and this kind of, this kind of functionality was available in RStudio, so you can have a list of the defined variables, but you couldn't get back where the, the, the variables were, def were defined, which was really painful at the end of a very long uh, experimentation. But also it contains an error log here, which allows you to check the logs uh, that were errored, actually. Oh, well, okay, I will move a little bit faster. Um, to show, okay, the next thing, you know, is plotting, definitely. So you want to plot information. I'm not an artist, right, but I like to have view of my data, being able to represent, you know, even slightly uh, what my data look like. So here I'm just creating a few examples based on the case class. And if I return the variable as a last statement, or statement of a cell, so I print what I can print. Like here is a table and a pivot chart. But actually, these are regular types. So I can have the table chart you, uh, widget in order to print examples. And then it introspects into the class, and then it shows the table for the data. Other things, so table affair is nice, but you want to print lines as well. So here I'm printing the data. Uh, I want to have the x-axis to be the IDs, the y-axis to be the values, and I want to group data per uh, per advanced feature, so which is true or false. And then I have my line charts. Uh, you get the ID, I will have that for the scatter chart and the, for the bar graph. Of course, so I'm basically a mathematician. I did a lot of graph theory. So one of the first features that I have it, I've added in, a, in my notebook was graph plotting. So I have created this graph DSL that allows you to define node and edges, assign them uh, values, properties, colors, size, and whatever. And here, actually, I'm using this, uh, inter this, uh, this DSL to create edges and nodes and connecting them uh, based on ADs. And then I can use a graph chart, which shows um, my, my points linked, uh, you know, using the edges. And again, yeah, it's a D3 uh, layout chart. I can increase the font, uh, the, the size of the chart, but I won't show it right now. Otherwise, I will run out, run out of time. So this is a geopoint chart. I did a lot of geospatial projects in my life. I, I love geos, geospatial stuff. So the second thing I have added for advanced chart was <coughs> geospatial information with lat long, for instance. And then I can group them using the count, limit to five, okay, just fetching the last, the, the first uh, state which have the most uh, uh, airports. Then I define a class for it. I convert my data frame as a data set, and I can print it. So it will looks like that, for instance. But I can also reshape my data set in order to say, OK, so now I want to assign a few colors and size to the states using the data frame API. And afterwards, I will use a geopoint chart and say, OK, the lat long fields are the lat and long. The R field is the R field, which means the, the, the radius. The color field is the C. And if I print it, then it's going to uh, fail because <laughs> I might forget something. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, that's my bad. Hotfix. Arc, Apache, Arc, Spark, SQL. and I should be okay, isn't it? Yeah, go ahead. So and now I have my, uh, my chart with uh, points and stuff like that, right? However, so, you know, lat long is very geospatial for dummies, right? So what we want is polygons, lines. So you can also fetch some data from the internet using, SH is actually a context for shell, so you pass a shell script, it downloads the data, then you can parse it using the, the tools that I'm providing in widgets. So you parse your JSON file, so you get back a JSON representation. You can do that for another file, which will be mainly lines. I parse it, I get the data, and then I can create a geo chart now, no, not a geo point chart, and then I will have my polygons there right away. I'm still using Scala, right? No JS, no HTML, no whatsoever, fully Scala. 
And, oh, by the way, I want to add an extra data set to it. OK, so you can use the add and apply function to it, and then it's going to update the chart with new information into it, which are basically roads. OK, you want to create fancy charts? Fair enough. You can also uh, create radars. So here, I'm a fan of basketball, so I created the a San Antonio Spurs data set from a website, which I'm mentioning. And then I create a radar chart onto it on the different fields, and I, then I can see what's going on there. Pivot. So it's a funny one, but I will quickly show it. So you can tune the way you want to plot things, actually, in the pivot chart by dragging and dropping uh, features onto the graph. Parallel coordinates is a very useful chart that allows you to uh, display in two dimensions uh, a, lot of dimen <coughs> a lot of dimensions uh, using your uh, lines. So you can filter using this kind of uh, things there. So you can say, OK, so 70, 75% for free throw and 3.3% uh, and so on. And then you get to the name here, Jonathan Simmons and Boris Dow. Um, time series, you know, one of the most Use, your most uh, common use case that we can see around, you create a data set with dates and, and values, and you get back a time series with dates and, and the values on the y-axis. Um, as I said, everything is reactive. So we've shown it already. I sh I've shown it already with uh, updates. So I won't show it here, but basically you can do it in a, in a loop and thread, and then the graph is updated uh, while the... the you know, the process is, uh, is executing the, the, the different threads there. Anyway, I like that. So I don't know if you know Shiny, but Shiny has the capacity to have reactive components that they can interact with each other. And what I have in, in the Spy Notebook is this uh, uh, operator that allows widgets to connect to the other, and that means that the drop-down list is sending events to this observer, which will update two different widgets, which is a output and the radar charts. So that means that if I have my radar chart showing all people there, I can go to Kawi or Ginobili, and it shows it. And I can get back to whole uh, because here I have a filter. Uh, if it's whole, I, feel, I don't filter anything. Synchronization. Um, I uh, won't have time, most probably. Actually, notebooks are synchronized. So if one chart is moving or displayed on one notebook, it's going to be displayed in the other tab. So everything is moving. Uh, at the same, uh, in the same manner, uh, because everything is connected to the same uh, web socket on the, on the server. Uh, you can also create new uh, chart type within the notebooks. If you want to do, really want to do JavaScript, so you can do it into the, into the notebook. Here, it's just a dummy example showing progress bars. And I explain how to create new widgets, by the way, here. I'm importing a few things, like I'm using extensively um, uh, type classes in order to, to have uh, implicit uh, to uh, convert my data types to uh, points, which is basically a string, uh, sequence of string and value. And then sampler is a, a type class in order to inject uh, policy for my sampling strategy. And here I'm connecting Scala with the JavaScript word here. And when I, I can create some data, uh, if it wants to run. So, uh, yeah, well, actually, I don't, why it's, I don't know why it's lagging, but it's lagging anyway. So but anyway, I can just consult things uh, if it doesn't work well. Yeah. Sometimes this happens. So if there is something wrong with the REPL, I would say that sometimes this can happen. If you execute too, uh, too, tricky, too tricky code, then sometimes the REPL gets uh, a little bit fuzzy. And, but you may have this. You just have to restart the REPL, and it goes fine. But it's, uh, I'm not going to show it anyway. Sorry about that. Um, so the thing that I was showing normally was a bunch of progress bar uh, evolving with the data coming into the threads as well. Um, LaTeX, so LaTeX is supported with interpolation, so you can use Markdown, and then you can put some LaTeX into it, and then it will be rendered as a regular LaTeX uh, strings. So these are a few bunch of advantages using something like a notebook, so you can get a feeling about the data, plot it the way you want to plot it, and having a better feeling about it. However, the last part, this was about tooling, 
But now, what about available models and algorithms? Because it's okay, so you can do statistics or arithmetics using your Scala and your, uh, your, uh, your uh, doubles or whatsoever. However, you need to do uh, data science, then you have to look for uh, models or you have to implement that. By the way, implementing a model is very easy, generally. You take the paper, you implement it. Generally, it's like two pages of, uh, of, of, uh, of text in the, in, the, in the paper, so it's like, a few hours code, but generally you don't want to redo it, though, then you have to look uh, in existing um, libraries. And in this notebook there, I'm listing a few of them. This is a work in progress, though. So I have listed uh, a few that I'm using uh, time to time. The most important one was probably uh, H2O, MLlib, and, um, and Deep Learning 4J. But in this notebook, I'm showing a few snippets Using Smile, for instance, Smile is a very, very wide library. So it has like 98 today implementation of algorithms and models. I, I cited them all here because it's very impressive. However, it's only, only local, right? It's a local implementation. It's very, very fast, but it's only local. So the list goes on. There we are. I've put a, something that I like because I like to estimate density uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, distribution. So I've put an example from, for MXNT. And here, if you want to execute it, so I'm downloading a few data, the train and the test. So there is a problem here, test. And I'm converting the data into something that I consume into the smile classification MaxNT. I apply it, and then we can consume the error. Um, deep Learning 4J, tomorrow I will give a, a, a talk with Melanie on how to do NLP with Deep Learning 4J in Spark. Uh, but Deep Learning is not only distributed, so it's also local. But here I'm showing a good example of using LSTM and the word, uh, word to vec model uh, to, to uh, do some sentiment analysis on text. And I put it even in Spark using this uh, constructor. MLlib is, of, of course, one of the most important uh, now in Scala. So it has quite a lot of implementation as well. But the thing is, the very difference is that everything is well distributed, very performant, scalable. So they're very focused on this fact, having things to be scalable as much as possible. Not, uh, and this is the, f the first factor to accept a model implementation. So this is just showing, and I'm stealing it from the, the documentation, which is very good. Uh, this is just a random forest implementation. Uh, I import the algorithm, the model, some utils to load the data. I'm taking some data for SVM initially. Then I split the data to have my training and test. I define some, a few parameters. I'm calling this object, then trans classifier with information that I want to. And then finally, I can do prediction directly on my own DADs. So it's very simple, a few lines, and you have your data trained into, uh, you have your uh, random forest model trained in distributed manner. And then you can, you can show a few uh, information regarding tester and so on. Something that I like, and I work with them on that, so uh, there is the, the University of Paris, which is now working on Spark streaming in order to create new algorithms, streaming, uh, so online learning algorithms. And this one is very interesting, I think, uh, uh, is JStream, uh, which is an adaptation of the gas neur neutral, uh, neural network. Essentially, it's a self-organized map, actually, but that works in, in the streaming manner. That means that you can actually detect new cluster on the fly. It's not like k-means, where you have to fix the hyperparameter k. Here, actually, you can detect new clusters because actually you are folding the space in order to detect uh, new clusters. Uh, based on the uh, optimization. And just showing uh, very quickly uh, how to do it um, uh, using the API, and also the coder is very simple. So you fix a few parameters, and, you, and you're good to go uh, using a DStream to uh, train the model. Um, so it's a work in progress. I, there are a few other uh, libraries that I want to show at some point in this notebook. H2O, which is a fantastic one, very performant. Uh, Figaro is the this next one. Oscar for um, operational research. Uh, Bayes Scala, which is more or less linked to Figaro at some point. 
uh, and maybe SysML and most probably OptiML, which is a Stanford project to implement a lot of models in Scala. So again, this code is available in this repository. Please clone it, fork it, build a Docker. If you don't want to build a Docker right now, it's going to be anyway available in the, in the Docker Hub. Uh, it's published in the, in the documentation anyway, but... Uh, so, uh, the connection is really poor, so I will leave it like this. And then finally, so yeah, I don't have any more um, connection. So, there are a lot of universities taking over, and they uh, start doing the courses in Scala directly. So, I know a few universities doing that. I said to do two of them, uh, the University of Paris and some uh, university in the uh, in Netherlands, the Radboud University. Uh, and there is also a link to the course if you want to follow it. And these guys are actually using the Spark Notebook for the student to get involved into Spark. Uh, there is some education companies. There is Data Science Retreat here um, on the floor in the light band booth. Uh, there is also the Data Science Incorporation in the US for which I'm a, I'm a mentor. Uh, it's also a 12 weeks uh, course introducing functional programming, distributed computing, and machine learning. And on GitHub, you will have this. It has been published yesterday, by the way, by this guy. So there are two courses using, again, the Spark Notebook in this case, uh, to explain how to do a machine learning using Scala and Spark. And of course, check this uh, website where there are a lot of packages published. So this is basically it regarding why Scala is most probably the, the next language for data science with a few arguments. Um, by the way, Lightband and ourselves in De La Felas, we are hiring. Uh, so please come to us uh, to ask what, where, when. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's it. Yeah, and we're both talking again tomorrow. So. Uh, yeah, we give two, uh, we give a talk each other uh, tomorrow. I think we're over time and it's party time. So if anybody wants to ask us questions offline, maybe we should do that. It's 47, oh, two minutes. Yeah. So thank you very much.